Thank you both of you for joining the panel today. And I'm, I'm great and very pleased and honored to welcome Dr. Andrew Kings and Dr. Helen Oliver to join us on the panel today. Thank you very much. I'm delighted that you invited us. Yes, thank you for the invitation. And the topic today for this panel is to mainly to talk about how data are used, especially looking at the, the data set that we have at the Cambridge Cybercrime Center. So I would like each of you to briefly talk about you know, your, your experience, your research area, and then we'll go from there. Uh, shall I go first? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I am just finishing up my PhD in uh, wearable systems uh, at the computer lab in the networks and operating systems group, and um, I was just um, looking for looking for something to do next. And the cybercrime center were looking for somebody to look at Russian crime forums, and it so happens that my first degree was in Russian. And it's not that my Russian is good or anything, but it's enough to read and analyze the contents of a forum. And so I really couldn't wait to uh, have an attempt at that and have a look at what kinds of things are talked about in these um, dark, dank places or light gray places of the Runet. Um. So I, um, I have an NLP background, so uh, computational linguistics background. Um, I'm a postdoc in the computer lab, uh, Cambridge, and yeah, just started working with people from the Cybercrime Center um, because they wanted to collaborate with people um, on the NLP side of things. So myself and um, Professor Paula Buttery started working with um, Dr. Alice Hutchings and and Sergio Pastrana a few years ago, and it's kind of it's grown from there really. So um, yeah, that's kind of what what brought me to the, this um, research space. So, what type of I guess data set are I and mean, Helen kind of touch upon it a little bit or. Uh, with regards to what type of data set you're working with. But uh, would you like to go a bit more into details describing kind of the data set you've used or are using currently for your work? Is that a question for Andrew or for me? Both, both of you. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it's my turn. So um, I was just, um, a paper came up about um, attitudes to, um, attitudes to risk and how um, how we handle the knowledge of our own death um, uh, Ross Anderson circulated that through the uh, through the department a few months ago and I wanted to see how perhaps Russian crime forums were discussing the threat of coronavirus um, and so all I did was a search on the keyword coronavirus so no synonyms or um say slang or slang words for it or anything like that just that one word um and i'm looking through it because there you know i'm sure we've all had a good look at how people cope with it over the past year or more which is that some of them cope with it by denying it some of some cope with it by stepping up their health regimes and trying to be as fit as possible and um, I just wanted to see what this this might tell us about these um, communities' attitudes to risk. And I found that most of them, uh, most of the appearances of that keyword were in news articles rather than user comments. But um, then this goes on to tell us what kinds of um, news sources and journalistic out outlets um, people posting on Russian crime forums find credible. So one thing leads to another. And um, it's only after digging around for a while that you know what your question is, really. So how does that compare to your experience, Andrew? Um, well, just on the question of which data sets I've, I've worked with, um, 
yeah, so mainly I've worked with hack forums, um, and in particular, you know, the, the hacking sections and the sort of marketplace trading sections. Um, but then also on top of that, I've had a little look at some of the, the data in Extreme BB um, as part of a student project and um, and also as part of an internship project, we, we used um, the phishing and spam uh, email data set um, that's, that's in the Cybercrime Center archives. Um, so yeah, so quite a nice range of different different data sources there. Um, and sorry, what so what was your follow up question? You think? Yeah, I was just wondering how it compares to Helen's experience with the data set, with what she just described. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess so. Rather than um, rather than going in on on one topic, we looked at hack forums in terms of how people interact and, um, you know, with what kind of um, intent and sort of, well, really, um, also how, how sentiment was expressed in, in conversation on these forums. So, you know, how maybe how conflicts arise, um, but also particularly how people show expertise and sort of demonstrate that they they are sort of key players in these networks in, in these forums. Um, and then, so that, that was really the work we've done with hack forums. Um, with, uh, with extreme BB, we've been looking a little bit at, ha at hate speech, um, and trying to sort of, um, classify and characterize that. And, um, and then also there's been a recent student project looking at perceptions of police in hack forums. So that was more similar to, to what Helen described in the sense that we, we went in looking for a, a specific topic. Um, and the list of search terms is pretty tricky because, of course, people refer to police in lots of ways, um, lots of different slang terms that you can imagine. Um, but yeah, that was just trying to sort of pretty much find a needle in a haystack, if you like, um, of like looking out for when people talk about the police and how, how do they talk about them. And it doesn't actually happen that often um, in hack forums. So, so, you know, the search is pretty, pretty challenging in that case. That's very interesting. I've personally worked with uh, Crime BB and Extreme BB as well, and I notice a lot of these underground marketplaces or forums, they have their own kind of set of arguments or terms and words that are specific to the community. So I wonder if, you know, when you're using maybe a more conventional tools or trying to run certain models on it, what kind of challenges do you encounter when trying to use, adapt some more conventional tools to analyze these more kind of context specific languages? Well, I, I suppose it's my turn, turn to answer. I mean, I started out with the um, with the sort of formal set of synonyms for coronavirus because that's what I was looking for, and um, the one that produced results was the word coronavirus. And we're we're talking about a few thousand rows of results here. Um, we're talking about posts in the hundreds rather than the tens of thousands or anything. Um, and so once I found those, um, what I, in order to properly understand them, because I'm new to this data set, I actually needed to read them rather than try and apply a tool to analyze it for me. So I'm the only thing I've turned up so far is that single keyword, but on my next pass, I am going to look at the user posts and see what um, see what words they use. Um, and search on that and see if the, the quality of um, and quantity of posts that comes up is uh, is very different. Um, so that's something I have yet to discover, but um, I, I know this is quite shocking, but the thing, the tool I'm most frequently using right now is 
SQL select queries plus my eyeballs. I think reading comprehension is kind of underrated these days. But that's a very important approach to actually understand the data, I would say, right? Because without reading through, you can yeah. really understand the context. Yes, I don't think anybody has yet invented an electric monk that can can read read and comprehend things for us. Um, so um, I'm really kind of if you're um, if you come from a software engineering background like I do, you're always kind of worried about not whether or not you're using the latest um, the latest tools and whether you're going to be unemployable or just laughed at if you if you aren't and um, so I'm uh, you always have this anxiety in the back of your mind that you're not being high tech enough but um, I think I don't know in order to fo focus on the task properly I have to not worry about that and I have to just um, do whatever's necessary at the next step and when I need to use or even myself develop um, a tool to automate something, I'll know. And it probably won't be exciting or high tech. I mean, the next thing I'm probably going to do is just going to be something to cleanse the data and trim the uh, white space off the end of each end of each row. Um, and excuse me if that's a bit too exciting. Um, I've got a little bit of NLP envy with the stuff that Andrew is doing. But yeah, go ahead, <laughs> Andrew, if you have anything to say. <laughs> oh, no, no, sorry, you think on. I, uh, I was just going to comment that, especially since you're working with a different language, a lot of time the nuances and differences in how, for example, coronavirus in the US, the, I mean, people were nicknaming it the Kung Flu, which I, I would assume is quite specific to, you know, maybe North America compared to Russia. So. I do value the qualitative approach you've taken to understand the context and, and how potentially a term is used or perceived and the nickname or nicknames and the other terms that people develop for it. So that's very the interesting. The only interesting thing I've, I've seen so far, I mean, admittedly, I haven't looked very hard. Um, all I found is Karova virus, which um, is just, that's just changing one letter and Karova means cow. So it's not very exciting. And I'm, I'm not sure that it even signifies much. I could be wrong about that. Um, but yes, so the most interesting thing is how, how many news articles have come up on the word coronavirus, um, just that keyword compared to the number of, um, to the number of comments and that most of them are actually, by far the majority of them are actually mainstream news agencies. So, so that's interesting. So it's, um, I mean, but that doesn't mean it tells you nothing because even though the words aren't coming out of the, out of the posters mouth, um, the amount of credence they, they give these news sources tells you something, right? Because in the UK, you can tell something about somebody if they're a Sun reader, and you can tell something about somebody if they're a Guardian reader. So what is it, what is it about these preferred news agencies that makes the, um, makes the posters on these forums want to share them? Um, so maybe it's not as exciting as um, counting the number, counting the amount of money changing hands, or or something like that. But um, this is what this is what came up, and it does help to understand how these people possibly think and perceive um, perceive truth or trustworthy sources in their daily lives. I agree. Thank you very much. So going back to Andrew. You know, so what are some of the challenges you've encountered, perhaps, when using conventional tools? Yeah, so, um, <coughs> sorry. So, yeah, so just picking up on what Helen said there about, um, you know, the natural language processing tools. Um, I think some people in, in the field might have you sort of believe that, you know, we've got, um, you know, absolute, uh, natural language understanding machines, um, but it's when you work with with data like uh, 
Crime BB and Extreme BB that you really um, you can see firsthand that um, standard NLP tools don't handle that kind of language very well. Um, you know, there's many reasons for that. Um, one is, you know, the kind of slang that we've talked about already. Um, another will be the quite specific lexicon, um, which perhaps, you know, c will confuse a standard NLP model. So the class classic example is, is a rat, which is obviously a, um, a specific cybersecurity term, but, um, you know, to a standard NLP model, it's, it's a furry rodent. Um, so those kind of things can trick, um, you know, a model that hasn't been adapted to this specific domain. Um, there's lots of other things like orthographic, casual, you know, uh, informality, you know, casual use of spelling convention, punctuation, emojis, etc. Um, a lot of the important information is sort of away from the text. So you get things, particularly with hack forums, you get things like links to um, tutorials or, um, uh, or you get code snippets, um, images, uh, and reputation voting, all, all that kind of stuff which is going on, um, which I think you need to try and handle uh, if you want to look at, you know, um, the impact of uh, certain posts. And so in our research, we're trying to figure out who, who are the key actors and what does their behavior look like? Um, and that's, you know, so much more than just, um, just the NLP on its own. Um, so yeah, and then um, I think this, this then brings us back to our eyeballs uh, or somehow really inspecting the data because the, the, the best way that I've personally learned about this um, research space is, is by doing some annotation. So, so doing the sort of laborious process of going through text by text and labeling it with the things that interest you, you know, the properties of the text that interest you. Um, and, you know, when you start doing that, you really quickly see how, um, how challenging this kind of text is going to be for, for normal NLP. Um, so we don't, we're still working on solutions to that. We, we definitely don't have all the answers to ha how you handle this kind of text. Um, so that's, yeah, ongoing research really. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely uh, would agree with what Helen says that um, the best way you can understand this data is to actually just get in, get in there and read, read some of the texts. So it's, it sounds like both of you have spent some time reading through various portion of the data set that you're working with. And this is more perhaps less about the data analysis, but rather your experience. Uh, did you find reading or spending long time reading these content have an impact on you in some ways? As some of the content could be a bit less mainstream with some of these data sets. Well, I mean, it's surprising how mainstream content I found actually was, because as I've said, the, the slice of it I'm looking at right now consists mostly of news articles from mainstream Russian news agencies. Um, and even the, the user comments that refer to any possible black or gray market transactions aren't, don't seem to be referring to anything uh anything extreme i don't think this is um i i really think that i'm looking at the, the kiddie pool of of crime discussion most likely um so mostly what i'm looking at is uh announcements of what this minister is going to do about um providing for uh prov providing financially for people suffering losses from quarantine or what rules they're going to make for quarantine. I've occasionally found a, sort of a racist article about, um, I don't know, I found one racist article about um, the Chinese describing a lot of cruelty to animals. And I found that a pretty upsetting article to read and it was very long as well, but that's 
I mean, I'm only looking at text. There are no images in this data set. Um, and so I haven't really found come across anything really upsetting. It's all, um, I mean, it's all stuff you're more than likely to find in a Russian newsstand. So lucky me. <laughs> But I, I would say that working on this topic that is, you know, sort of closely to what is happening around the world would, is, is challenging as well, right? Because you're, you can distance yourself from coronavirus, which is still ongoing, so. True. Um, but there's not, uh, there's not, there are not many, many comments about people being personally affected by it. I mean, a, a few I've found have been a, about them not really believing it. And that, that is kind of upsetting when I see people saying stuff like that, but it's, again, it's ubiquitous, unfortunately. It's it's similar noise to what we're hearing over here in the UK. So I suppose um, conspiracy is gonna conspiracy. That's very interesting. Um, Andrew, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> So on hack forums, it, as part of Crime BB research, um, we do sometimes see people getting into an, an argument. Um, and that's the kind of thing that sadly is quite mainstream, quite normal on the internet. You know, it's the kind of stuff you'll have seen on social media, you know, where um, a conversation can get out of hand. Um, it will keep escalating until it sort of becomes very personal and vitriolic. Um, we do sometimes see people sort of stepping in and trying to um, to moderate or to, or to um, to mediate those conflicts. Um, but you know, usually those two those two members of hack, hack, you know hack forums will have their argument and then they'll just sort of go away and and give each other some negative reputation or something. Um, so it's not too shocking in that sense. Um, that's in <clears throat> sorry, that's in the hacking space. Um, we did some work a few years ago where we found that actually it's a relatively nice place where people are actually, are actually trying to cooperate and collaborate. Um, certainly it's less aggressive than um, uh, discussions about Wikipedia edits between um, authors of Wikipedia pages where it gets quite quite confrontational. So we found that Hack Forums was a ni nicer space than that. Um, um, but actually, you know, then more recently, we've looked a little bit at when people are just chatting about current current affairs um, in in other sections of hack forums. So, so th the sort of common um, social areas, and that's where you start to see, you know, a few a few um, hints of the prejudice, which is obviously there bubbling under. Um, so quite often, there's some um, racism or sort of um, you know, discrimination on on the basis of people's religion and, and things like that. Um, and actually, if you go on to look at some extreme BB texts, that's when it really gets pretty um, pretty nasty. Really, I mean, it's 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 probably nothing that will shock anyone because it's it's you know it's the kind of misogyny and racism and homophobia that unfortunately you know it is on the internet, but um, Extreme BB seems to be a place where these people come together, and it's it's not it's not moderated in any way. Um, so, in terms of my own experience, you know, so so none of that really shocked me, which is perhaps sad. Um, but at the same time, if you if you actually read those texts for a long time, you do need to step away and take a deep breath and sort of remind yourself that there are nice people <laughs> in the world, um, and that this is just a small corner of of internet discussion um but yeah it does make you sort of reflect on you know how, how do people come to have these views which is just clearly so um so hateful towards certain groups um so i think you do have to approach extreme bb with a bit of care and sort of feel prepared for for seeing some um text which is pretty upset you know can be pretty upsetting in terms of what people are saying so 
for you know ex ex experts with your, of um, like yourself, what advice would you give to perhaps students that are interested in doing interdisciplinary work on cybercrime and cybersecurity? I mean, I would would suggest to trust themselves and do apply the skills they have to what's in front of them and let one thing lead to another rather than trying to force um to rather than trying to pull a question out of the data try looking through it until it shows you a question you want to answer and have some trust in yourself that you will know what skills to apply to it or you will know who to ask when you when you need to rather than thinking that you have to um impose a um i don't know drunken random forest perceptron neural network with with um i don't know with with go faster stripes on it because um <sighs> That remember that the the um, technology is there to to help you to think. It's not something that that is there for you to worry that you're failing to live up to. I guess. I think those are really good advice. I think sometimes when people step into the field, they have certain preset not well perception or understanding of what an interdisciplinary approach should be so i think that's a very interesting take on it how about andrew from your perspective um yeah it's it's a really good point i think um i think this research area is um is a really uh it's a really appealing one for interdisciplinary research because um i mean we see in in the cybercrime center that people from many different backgrounds come together and and share their own perspectives on on the research questions so you know people from criminology or people who have a psychology background um computer science background um yeah so uh in terms of advice i um I, I'm I'm not sure really what to say other than um, you know obviously you just got to keep an open mind when you come to perhaps when you come to a discipline which isn't your normal area um, because you're you're you know you have to learn from the experts in that area um, and you have to um, I think like Helen says trust your trust your own skills um, and you know obviously. Um, believe that there's some contribution you can make um but i think equally you know you have to be very open-minded about um the difference in the domain compared to what you've been used to and i think that's pretty evident um for people from an nlp background um because we're used to dealing with you know like news articles or um very nicely written documents which um uh, you know, we'll probably have a single author and it won't be a conversation. Um, it won't have much slang and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think it kind of helps you um, adapt and, you know, try and expand your own skill set as well. So I think there's lots of good reasons to to try and do some interdisciplinary work. So on that note, I will pose the last question and I will be interested and curious to see what your thoughts are on it. So what do you think is the future of interdisciplinary work, especially with regards to cybercrime and cybersecurity? How do you envision it, I guess? I mean, that's that's a hard question. I'm I'm lucky to figure out what I'm what I personally am going to do tomorrow, never mind what other people are going to do next week but i i do think that um uh, bellingcat is is making more and more of it of an impression and they're sort of everywhere you look right now and they are um sharing their techniques that i mean the, their techniques are aimed at pinpointing specific individuals or the the locations of particular acts and i'm not pursuing anything nearly so dramatic 
but the more I read of their materials and techniques, um, the the more emboldened I feel to explore um, to explore this space. Not necessarily because I'm about to use them myself, but because of simply because of the way they think about these things. So I, I would say that um, probably the the leaders of of this are going to be open source investigators more and more simply because I, I find the um the the seminars they hold and the tutorials they put out just so informative um so i think from the nlp perspective there's a lot of work to do. Um, so some of the things I've been talking about, um, such as handling, you know, the non-standard nature of the text, um, I think we're sort of still playing catch up on that. There's, you know, still um, a lot of work to do. Um, in general, we need lots of eyes on the data. So the more cross-disciplinary research we can do, collaboration with social scientists, um, criminologists, um, the more of that we can do, the better. Uh, can I just give a quick plug for Postcog, which will be a website um, designed for that purpose. So um, it's being developed by um, Ildiko Pete in the Cybercrime Centre um, as part of um, a, a sort of cross-disciplinary project led by Alice Hutchings and, and Ross Anderson um, and Paula Buttery. So we're trying to put, we're trying to make um, CrimeBB um data available to to other researchers from from any field um so that they can search the the data in a sort of familiar um search engine type way and then hopefully we'll be able to um you know support that with nlp um labels and predictions and hopefully learn from what they tell us about the data really. So um, I think that side of inter interdisciplinary research um, is still um, still developing quite quickly. And there's, I think there's lots of potential there for, for um, sort of um, bi-directional um, benefits. Um, the other thing I really hope we do in the immediate future is go beyond English in terms of what, what we've been looking at. So um, NLP generally has been really focused on the English language but um, yeah I mean I'd really like to for example work with Helen and, and look at the Russian data that's in the cybercrime center um, I think that there's also Chinese and, and German data being collected and um, perhaps some other languages I haven't mentioned um, but yeah I think I think generally NLP has a long way to go we need to look at a lot of the tech to understand it better um, and, you know, then maybe think about the applications that, you know, where can this lead us in terms of um, making an impact, um, helping forum administrators or sort of um, uh, other, other researchers interested in what's going on within the forum. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think that we'll do all of that, but if we could just chip away a little bit, that would be that would be great. I have to second that uh, that plug for Postcog. It's a really fantastic resource already, and it's only going to get better. I agree. I have a chance to test uh, one version of the prototype, and it was it was very helpful to actually search through the data set in a like Andrew described a search engine kind of interface where you don't have to know SQL mm -hmm. <laughs> to search through a big data set, especially when you have millions of posts that you want to search through. And you only want to look at, let's say, one topic of it. So um, that's all I have. Do you have any last word for the audience? Um, you should still wear a mask when you go out. <laughs> yes, agree. Yeah, no, I am. Um, th thank you for listening, I guess. And we'll be at the Q&A. Yes. Yeah. yes, we'll uh, talk to you later. And thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.